Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today is the 30th of August. Today we're doing a frontline update beginning with the situation around Harrison. In this region, we have a geolocated video. I do not know the date for this video. Nobody mentioned it, which could raise some suspicion as to whether it was an old video or a new video. But we do have a video of Ukrainian forces raising a flag above the village of Dachi, which just confirmed that the Ukrainians at least at some point had a presence over here. But this is really adding to a lot of evidence from other reports and from other footage of the Ukrainians do still have a permanent position within this bridgehead, which spans across a pretty wide area, not just around the Antonovsky Bridge, but across the entire village of Dachi. And Dachi is characterized by, first of all, the area around the Antonovsky Bridge, where the Ukrainians were originally stationed around. They would basically send men across the river, Dnieper River, and then they'd be stationed under the Antonovsky Bridge because that would provide them with cover. Since then, they have expanded their positions to nearby rural houses. You could see all the cottages over here that the Ukrainians have control over. And now it also seems like they have control over the rural houses that are to the east of the Antonovsky Bridge over here. And this is based on footage which was released, I believe, August 27th, which shows that there was a Su-34 uh, Russians, they hit Ukrainian positions in Dachi, and it appears like they dropped a Fab 500 glide bomb onto the Ukrainian positions, which is par for the course. You see a lot of this around Kherson. The Ukrainians, they try to send forces into one of these fortified areas or trying to sort of congregate in a certain house as they send their elements across the river. And then the Russians, they launch a mortar or artillery strike. And in the most extreme situations, they launch these Fab 500 glide bombs. And this confirms that Ukrainians do have uh, activity in this region. Doesn't mean they have full control over it. But this means that the Ukrainian activities in this region around Dachi are different than other DRG operations. Because in other DRG operations that Ukraine does across the Dnieper River, they are usually very transient. And what I mean by that is that you have the Ukrainian forces crossing over and conducting a very quick operation before withdrawing at night, perhaps across the river back to their original positions. And the difference is with Dachi is that the Ukrainians have been able to hold a bridgehead over there for multiple months, actually, starting in um, even before July, I believe. But that's when we started hearing a lot about this. And even now, they still have control over it and continue expanding it. This doesn't mean they're going to launch an offensive anytime soon, but it, this would provide a springboard for any sort of offensive. And it also provides a springboard for Ukrainian DRG operations, so reconnaissance and harassment operations to happen even further south than uh, previously imagined across maybe even the Konka River towards a place like Oleshki, which is a major Russian uh, local hub in the region. And uh, all, all in all, this shows that Ukrainians have been able to expand their positions over here. There are some new developments on the Robotnya front. And it was a video that was geolocated, which is very important to mention, which was released right before I started recording this video. So we're going to look at that first. So this is a video that was released by the Russian 100th Reconnaissance Brigade and their artillery group, which shows the Russian forces shelling Ukrainian uh, infantrymen. So they were on foot, no mechanized assault, as they were walking through hedgerows northwest of Vrobove, which is very interesting because geolocation shows that these Ukrainian soldiers from the 82nd Air Assault Brigade that were advancing towards Vrobove were in an area that was behind the fortifications constructed by the Russian forces in this area. So what fortifications did the Russians have that the Ukrainians passed by? Well, those would be anti-tank ditches. You had anti-tank ditches. That's sort of like the first echelon in this region of defenses that would be around here, for instance. And then behind that, you have the dragon's teeth. So you can see how those defenses were constructed primarily to fight against the tanks that the Ukrainians might have been sending or the infantry fighting vehicles, not really against Ukrainian small arms group because those infantrymen could obviously maneuver past a ditch and they could obviously maneuver past dragon's teeth by walking past them. And you could see how they also use the hedgerows to their advantage, trying to use them as concealment. Either way, these Ukrainian soldiers got spotted. So it's not like the Ukrainians have been able to actually take over or enter Vobova yet. Maybe they have, but there's not enough information to corroborate that. But what this does mean is that Ukrainians have been able to establish a new route through which they can continue sending attacks, continue sending forces towards the northwestern part of Verbove. So I expect we'll see a lot of fighting in this region in the coming days, and both sides have sources reporting 
that heavy fighting has already broken out in this direction. So keep an eye out for what happens over here. And at the same time, the Ukrainian forces are also continuing their gains in the areas that are to the west of Verbove. So you could see over here how I've adjusted the map to show that the Ukrainians have advanced even further south, taking over uh, all, all of these fields over here that I've marked in blue. You can see they have been able to advance, you could say, perhaps about about 1.6 kilometers, something like that. And there's actually a geolocated video released by the Russian Beaver drone unit, which was 2.5 kilometers away from the initial lines from yesterday's video, which shows their Beaver unit. Uh, they had an FPV drone that hit Ukrainian infantry. It was two Ukrainian infantrymen. I don't know what happened to them, but there was a hit on them. That's what the Beaver unit alleges. And this is pretty deep into Russian lines even deeper than I have depicted on the map because it's not like you have a large Ukrainian garrison in these regions so you can't really mark it as under Ukrainian control but it does show that the Ukrainians have activity in this region which does pave the way for increased attacks and control in the future and this means that the Ukrainians are very close to taking over a height 1368 which is a local hill in the region which would give them as I said in my last video a pretty good uh, observation post to overlook for Prokopivka and Verbova as well, and all of the Russian fortified positions around the uh, fortifications that they set up over here. And uh, that's really it for Robotina. If we zoom in on the Vukhlyar fronts, you'll see that there haven't been many updates recently. I did adjust the gray zone to make it more accurate. But besides that, the Ukrainians have been able to make positional gains amounting to about 700 meters, advancing in the direction of Shevchenko. Nothing significant, just a minor gain. Now on the flip side, you also have Russian positional gains in the area around Shumi. If you don't know where that is, and I'll zoom out to show you, that's on the outskirts of Horlivka, on the Donetsk city axis. So basically, in this area, there were no gains by the Russian or Ukrainians really for the entire war because both sides had these fortified trenches that were set up in 2014 and they weren't able to move past them just due to the static nature of the conflict. So the Russian lines you could see in this region were around here and the Ukrainian lines around here. So the Russians, and this is the reason why I'm even mentioning this, they were able to advance a couple hundred of meters based off of a geolocated video which shows Ukrainians shelling the new Russian positions within a rail line. And you could see the blue marker where this occurred. This occurred over here. And this indicates that the Russians were able to, at some point, I don't think it was recent, I think it actually happened many months ago when Russia was actually increasing pressure around the Donetsk city axis. But what this means is that at some point, the Russians were able to break through past the line of contact, past their own defenses, and take up new positions in a rail line that is adjacent to the Ukrainian trench positions, which would be over here. So uh, here's a video, it's linked on my map. UA shelling Russians in Shumi, zoomed in over here. Moving on to Klishivka and Andrivka, the Ukrainians have been able to increase control of the fields that are to the west of Andrivka. So you can see that this is the area where they've been attacking recently within these blue rectangles. And they have not been able to enter Andrivka yet, but they have been able to take positions very, very close to it, which will allow for attacks on the village later on. And it also gives them control of some of the heights that are overlooking Andrivka and overlook uh, certain Russian positions, not around Kordyumivka because Kordyumivka is also on pretty high elevation, but along this rail line. This rail line that I'm going over in red is sort of a Russian fallback line in case of the fall of Klishivka or Andrivka. They have set up dugout, dugouts in this area. They have positions in the hedgerows adjacent to the rail lines on uh, both sides. And so this is a way for the Ukrainians by taking over the heights that are to the west of the rail line to fire upon those positions in the future. And at the same time, if we go a bit to the north, you'll see that the uh, Ukrainians, there's allegations that have been able to take up to half of Klishivka. And I've seen a lot of maps that are beginning to mention this, and, and it happened yesterday actually, where a lot of maps adjusted uh, their indication of the situation to show that the Ukrainians have about 50-50 control over the village while the Russians control the northeastern part. So this is how they mark the front line, looking something like this, with the blue line being the separation between the Ukrainian and the Russian forces. Now, I don't know uh, if there's any sort of additional evidence to prove this, 
but I know there's one video that a lot of people have been circulating since August 26th, which would be the one piece of evidence to prove that there is a 50-50 split in Klishivka, and that's the video over here. Uh, this is a video, uh, not this one, this video over here. So this video is of the Lyud Brigade, and specifically the Safari Regiment within the Lyud Brigade, which is a national police brigade fighting in central Klishivka, and basically in the video you can see there's firefights, house to house fighting with small arms fire, all of that. And this happens pretty deep into Klishivka, which would imply that the Ukrainians have been able to advance pretty deep into the village. But we don't know when this video was recorded. It could easily be an old video. And if this is all that the allegation that the Ukrainians have been able to break through and advance deep into Klishivka is predicated on, then that's not enough evidence to back up that claim. Because think of it, there have been so many different Ukrainian assaults on Klishivka, and the Lyud Brigade has been involved in several of them in more, more recent weeks, not in some of the older attacks. So we don't really know if this is an old one unless, uh, or a new one unless we receive confirmation of when the video was recorded. So far, I've not seen that. So I'd be dishonest if I was changing the map. So I'm going to wait out. I'm not saying it's impossible. I've also seen reports from Ukrainian and Russian sides reporting that the Ukrainians are increasing pressure in this region. So I am waiting for additional information. It may be right, may be wrong. We don't know. Around seeing Kivka, the Russians have not been able to take the village yet, but they are advancing around it. They've been able to advance a couple hundred meters around the forested area just to the east of Liman Lake over here. And they were also able to take over new positions in the fields that are just to the east of Sinkivka, generally in this area over here. Uh, I'd say they were able to advance as well a couple hundred meters, maybe uh, about 800, 900 meters as the Ukrainians repaired defenses on their fallback line, which is around the houses in Petropavlivka. So the Ukrainian line runs sort of like this. But at the same time, the reason why the Russians have not been able to advance around here, it's twofold. First of all, it's similar to what I was saying before about Russian operations in Luhansk. They're not really meant at a massive offensive towards Kupiansk. They're most, more so meant at diverting Ukrainian forces elsewhere. And the second reason why is because the Ukrainians have been able to send reinforcements that are counterattacking nonstop. There's very uh, there's an increase in Ukrainian counterattacks from you know the 67th Mechanized Brigade, for instance, 14th Mechanized Brigade, and as a result, the Russians have been on a defensive posture in a lot of these parts of the front line, and because of that, they've not been focusing on their own attacks. Now, there's one last thing that I have to mention about the front line, which I should have mentioned before, but I forgot. My bad. Is regarding Putin the Russians have fallen back from their fort positions around Putne, which were around this nature reserve. So I'll circle that over here. You could see over here, that's the Russian fort position originally around a hedgerow. But since then, they've pulled back a couple hundred meters towards a new line over here. It's about actually 1.4 kilometers away from their original line. And the area that they pulled back from included a lot of very important heights. And these heights could now be taken over by the Ukrainians actually believe that they've already pushed into this region. So I have to change the map to indicate that the Ukrainians have control over the regions over here. And this doesn't mean that the Ukrainians have taken over all of the heights that are to the northeast of Putne. There are a lot of hills in the area northeast of Putne, which includes this entire area over here that I'm marking in this rectangle. But this shows that the Ukrainians are pushing in this direction and that they're trying to take over these hills. And the reason why is pretty clear. They want to provide cover for their forces that are located in Stormayorska and Aruzhenia because the Russians currently hold positions in heights that overlook the Mokriali River Valley. Mokriali River is over here and it makes it harder for the Ukrainians to advance further south towards towns like uh, Zhivitny, Bajanaya or Storm Lenivka. So that's why the Ukrainians are pushing in this direction. It would also give the Ukrainians a new axis through which to attack Putin from a new direction. One last thing that has to be mentioned is that last night there were a series of Ukrainian drone strikes that were launched across multiple different Russian oblasts. And I'll just highlight some of them where there were reports of drone strikes or reports that airports were closed. You had that in Tombow, Tambov, in Lipetsk, Oryol, Tula. You had that in the Moscow region as well. You also had that in the Bryansk region. And in the Bryansk region, we actually had geolocated footage of what was going on. Here you have a video of a strike on Bryansk. 
there was a drone strike on the Silicon EL plant, which is one of Russia's largest microelectronic enterprises. So Russian sources report that a fire broke out on the 16th building of the plant and that after an hour it was extinguished. But really the main target, which is being discussed right now, is in Pskov over here. This city is very close to Estonia. If you take out the measuring stick, you'll see it's about 30 kilometers away from the border with Estonia. And you can see that the airbase specifically was hit and that according to Russian sources, there were 22 UAVs involved and that those UAVs, uh, at least some of them were able to hit Russian IL-76 uh, aircraft, transport aircraft. And Russian sources report that four have been damaged. The, uh, there was a fire there that broke out due to the burning of the fuel. And there are some unconfirmed reports that additional aircraft were destroyed. I've seen allegations up to six being damaged, but those can't be confirmed just yet. And this is very interesting because this is so close to the Estonian border. So I've seen a lot of theories as to whether this came from Estonia. I don't believe that to be true because I don't think Estonia would risk having a confrontation with Russia like that. There's allegations that it came in from Ukraine, although that's very far away. And that would be a massive success because they'd be able to basically um, go without being noticed by any of Russia's air defense systems for hundreds and hundreds of kilometers. So I don't think that's the case either. I think the most likely scenario is that you had this decentralized Ukrainian uh, partisan operation uh, in conjunction with the SPU and other intelligence agencies throughout all of Russia. And they were able to coordinate together these drone attacks within Russia itself, which makes it harder for air defense system to intercept it. What's interesting is the fact that electronic warfare was not able to prevent this attack as well. And we're going to have to see uh, and wait for additional details on the full extent of the damage. But thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.